So this is the three switch topology that I was showing you. time from the client point of view uh, over the past 30 seconds. So this is a time series. And then y axis is the uh, completion time from 0 millisecond to 500 millisecond. And um, you can immediately see that there is a, an intermittent problem here. So ideally, you want to see almost flat line at around 30 millisecond. And that 30 millisecond is dictated by the RGT and the size of the page and, and, and those kind of things. But it's, first of all, even without these off the chart uh, spikes, this is already problematic, right? It's, even without this, this is like 2x, occasionally. So that's, that's bad. But off the chart, phone is really bad. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen all the time. It happens sometimes. By looking at this, you can't get any picture. I mean, any network looks like this, as I said. And this is the number of packets dropped at each switch in uh, every second, but you know, you have access control list, so some traffic is always dropped, and TCP also introduces drops to be able to find the fair share, so drops alone do not give you much information. So this is where the INT, uh, Invent Network Telemetry, comes to rescue. So uh, you are the physical network owner, you need to tell whether this is actually a physical network problem or not. And to be honest, this kind of behavior can be caused by non-physical network issues. Right? Their backend server issues, or their application issues, or even if it's network, it could be Android's networking stack issue. Right? A lot of data plane, da data center owners introduce some changes to their TCP stack or some network virtualization layer. What if they introduce some bugs or regressions there? So there are so many things that can go wrong, so everybody needs to chime in say that, hey, yes, this is my problem or not. And as a physical network owner, you need to know whether this is a physical network problem or not. And INT can help them. So uh, with INT, I'm going to collect, I, I can collect any metadata available in these switches, and then I can copy the metadata into the data packets. And then the, the data packets actually carry the information about the networking behavior that they observe while being forwarded. Um, so I'm going to collect the switch IDs and the queuing latency. You could have collected many other things. I'm just collecting those two pieces of information because uh, open times queuing latency reveal a lot of information, especially in data center or enterprise like network. Because propagation latency is already fixed, almost negligible. Right? So if there is some significant latency, it should be queuing latency. And then why do I co collect switch IDs? In this particular topology, I don't have a physical loop. But in, in typical data centers, there are physical loops, and if something goes wrong, routing protocol convergence or wrong configuration, physical loops may happen. So by collecting the you know, switch IDs, you may be able to collect that as well. So let me just enable that mechanism. <coughs> so this INT feature is already pre-implemented in P4. I just enabled that through the runtime configuration. So that's enabled on all the three switches. Now these three switches, whenever they see TCP packets, they embed their switch ID and the queuing latency that happened for that packet at that time. And then to do that, I need to create some new space in the header. Right? Uh, so instead of defining a new header format, I just simply decide to reuse some of the unused uh, TCP options. And, and why? Of course, I, sh I could have introduced a completely new protocol, but if you did, did that, then you have to modify your Randos networking stack. And I'm using real TCP IP stack here on vanilla Linux, so I, I felt that that's a little too much work, so I just decided to use TCP options. The downside of TCP options is that you can attach only up to 40 bytes. 
So that works only for a very small network, but this is a small toy network for now, just for demo. So now uh, these TCP packets carry this information. I just need to go into either here or here and then collect the additional pieces of information and then visualize them. So I'm going to do that by going into host number three. Um, so let me open the terminal or host three. So this is host three terminal. Okay, so these are the plots. So each packet carries two pieces of information because it's coming from there to here and it's two hop path. So the red dots are the king latency collected at switch number one, or from switch number one. Blue dots are the king latency collected from switch number three. So packet, this is a sequence of packets, time series, and each packet has two dots. So compare between this and these charts. Sorry. This and this chart. Okay. So one thing you can easily notice is that when, when the user perceived performance is fine, both dots are sort of contained, well below 10 milliseconds or something. But whenever there is some problem, user perceived performance problem, there is immediate correspondence here. So blue dots usually go off. And that, that correlation is just perfect because the packets themselves are working as probes. So you don't need to do extra coordination. If you use counters, okay, some counters <coughs> are going off, but how do I know that these counters affected the, exactly these packets or these connections? So that attribution is extremely difficult in, in normal network, but INT makes that trivial. So now you know that, oh, sorry, this is really a physical network problem. Occasionally, switch three queues blow up. I don't know why yet, but I know that this is my problem, and I'm going to take the ball from here. So we have more tools that you can, or more, more ideas that you can uh, recruit to, to move from here even further. For example, the, the big question is, OK, I know that this is happening at switch number three, but who is causing this, and why? When is this happening? I need to know who is causing this so that I can actually shut it down, right? So we can think about more and then come up with ideas and then realize that in P4 to go that far. Okay. So that concludes this demo. And then let me quickly show you another demo. <coughs> can I ask a quick question? Yes. So uh, just to be clear, so with your uh, program, you yeah. define that you can send a packet, yeah. and that packet will be stamped with the key. Yeah, and the switch IDs. The switch IDs. Yeah. And what part of the packet is that placed in? Uh, TCP options. Yeah. Okay, so the second demo that I want to show you by the way, so this is a very long code doing IMT. <coughs> so I introduced a new table called INT table. The key is just IP protocol, so that I can do this only for maybe UDP or TCP. Of course, it can be more granular. You can do this only for particular connections if you take five people here. And then the action is export queue latency. And this is the custom action. So I define INT header. This is basically nothing but TCP options, at length value. And then um, these are the macros, TCP option in, TCP option in length. And then I copy switch ID and then queuing latency, which is a met intrinsic metadata available on this target. And I update the TCP offset, and, and that's all. So we'll go through something like this through the assignments. So you don't need to understand the full details of this code, but I just wanted to give you the sense of coding work that you, you have to do. Did you, did you 
excuse me, it doesn't specify where in the packet that the uh, integer is added. So that's coming from another specification? From the yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the header dot p4 will actually, yeah, contains this, but I didn't show it. Okay. Copy the code synthetic with that. Uh, is there a standard so any kind of target with the door has to have Yeah, the standard intrinsic metadata is available on the p4 yeah. spec. Yeah. And then the part of the standard architecture uh, definition work that I mentioned yesterday at the workshop is precisely to codify this kind of set. <coughs> Old standard compliant architecture should contain or support this kind of intrinsic metadata that part of it. So the Okay, so this, the full INT spec and INT code and demo is available. The, the actual INT spec that we push it forward is not using TCP options. TCP options is a little too childish. <laughs> um, so we're using some other protocol formats, so that's available here. Another scenario that I want to quickly, quickly run through is a uh, traffic split problem. So I'm going to build to this topology, it's very small leaf spine topology, two leaf, two spine, <coughs> each leaf has two end hosts, and then monitor happens to be at another end host. And I'm going to create two TCP connections, host one to host three, and host two to host four. Then let's see what happens. Okay, so this demo, you're going to <coughs> run a simpler version of this demo as an assignment. So this is the network, and I, it doesn't have any background traffic right now, so I'm going to generate some traffic. Um, by copying So I just ran hyper server on host number three. I'm going to do the same thing on host number four. So two hyper servers, and then I'm going to run one connection from host number one to host number three. And I'm going to create another connection from host number two to <coughs> host number four. Okay, so, and then let's do this. So, two connections are running, so they're sharing the bandwidth. This is 5 megabits, and all the links are 5 megabits. So, as you can see, this is an you know, exaggerated version of elephant flow collision. These two flow, there are only two flows in this network. They happen to use the same physical path, although there is one more path. So, the aggregate capacity is 10 megabits from left to right. But they're using only 5 megabits, yes, because ECMP happened to be choosing the same path. Um, there are many, many different ways of you know, addressing this problem. I'm not, showing, I'm not going to tell that the problem that I'm choosing is going to be the best one. Not, by no means it's not at all. But I'm going to choose something called flow-led switching. So um, basically, uh, how many of you are you know, familiar with this notion, flow-led switching? So, so TCP connections um, can have bursts, and then if these bursts are separated enough by more than RTT, then even if you use different physical path for different bursts, you might not introduce out of order delivery, and hence TCP will be fine, and yet you're actually using multiple paths, so your aggregate capacity goes up, so it's resource So I'm going to introduce that mechanism. Already, it's already implemented in P4, I'm just enabling that mechanism. running this command. So that mechanism is enabled on leaf one. And now you will see the difference. So it immediately kicks in. And then uh, it's not as stable because there is some, some parameter tuning that you need to do. But um, the interesting, really interesting thing here is this question. So you might ask, uh, these are long running connections. These are not, you know, request and response style 
connections, and why are they? Why why is there uh, you know, flow in the first place? Is it going to be just a continuous stream? If there is no flow, that how how is this happening? So the really exciting thing here is that whenever they happen to collide, then then the queue builds up somewhere in the system, and then congestion happens. Then when congestion happens, they either have, they both have to be uh, backing up, and then that backup introduces flow depth. because there is more number of packets or bytes in flight, and then they have to remain silent because they have to cut the congestion window. And that actually actively introduces flowlets. And then when you have flowlets, you have more chances. You flip. And then by luck, these two connections may choose different path. Then congestion doesn't happen. So they tend to stay there. So that's very interesting behavior that you can observe uh, in, in this simulation. So once they choose different paths, they don't ever come back to the same path. Occasionally they come back, but it seems like it's it's rather stable from there. So this simple flow that switching idea, it's not some elaborate high-level adaptive flow that switching or something. It's really simple flow that switching. Uh, it's, the idea is doable through this kind of concept or design, implementable in P4. So basically, you introduce your flow that detection and management table. This is built with register in P4 language or P4 construct or stable memory. So you have this table, and then this table is addressable by the hash of five tuple. So you have new packet, take the five tuple and then hash it, and then this becomes a location onto the hash table. And then you remember last time when this table entry was referred to, and just a monotonically increasing flow that ID, an integer value. You go there, what you do is just simple logic. You, you have your current time, that's intrinsic metadata. This packet's arrival time. You calculate the delta between current and last, and if that's larger than your flow led timeout or inter flow led gap, I don't know, it's your configurable parameter, then you know that, oh, this is the first packet of a new flow led. So I'm going to increment flow led ID by one, and then you always reset this last time whenever you go there. So now when you do real, you know, uh, next up, decision making, instead of using just 5 tuple, like ECMP, you use 6 tuple hashing. 5 tuple plus your flow that ID. So if your flow that IDs are different, you may end up choosing different path, different next path. So um, you may say that, okay, then what about collisions? Not a big deal. Right? Um, first of all, hash collisions are infrequent, mainly because we're not connecting, we're, we're not collecting or tracking all the connections here. The number of flowlets are much, much less than the number of connections typically because flowlets are very small. So they, they come, but they go away very quickly as well. So collisions are less frequent. And then even if the collision happens, it's not the end of the world, right? You're just lowering the optimality a little bit, but it's, you're not breaking any reachability or something like that. And then uh, finally, this timeout and those things are all configurable. So, in fact, realizing this in P4, I'm not going to go through this, of course. I just wanted to give you a sense of the kind of coding that you have to do, realize these ideas. About 100 lines of P4 code. So most of the P4 code is like this. It's some hundreds of lines, uh, but you need to come up with the right design. So it's not like tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of kernel coding or something like that. And that's the power of sort of declarative or high abstraction domain-specific language. Okay, so that concludes all the, all the things that I have.